Best Book Bits podcast brings you Stephen Spicer, founder of Spicer Capital, investment guru, and author of the book, Stop Investing Like They Tell You. Stephen, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Michael. Come on. I'm excited. No problem. Um, now, for people who don't know you, uh, uh, where are you from? I'm from Arkansas in the United States. Beautiful. And uh, take us back to your early years. How did you get into the investing game? Sort of what did you, what was the 18 year old Stephen doing? Uh, what was your sort of first job after school? Take us back to the good old days. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I grew up, uh, my, my father is a entrepreneur. And so he was always talking about, talking about investments and identifying them and studying them. And uh, whenever I was 12, I, I, asked, uh, I asked for the Wall Street Journal for my birthday because that's my dad was always talking about this stuff, so I wanted to, I wanted to see it. That was back when you got these big, thick newspapers every day. So that's kind of where it started. I picked my first stock in in 1999. It was Microsoft, which did terrible for 14 years, right? I mean, right before the dot com crash. But uh, it was good, good experience, and uh, I always I knew that I wanted to to do something in that field. I wanted to to work with individuals on that on that level. Uh, and so right after college, uh, I went and worked with Northwestern Mutual. I wanted to, to do the holistic financial planning bit, uh, you know, because I knew it was more than it was more than just investments. My dad did a really good job at, at planning. We might get into that that later, but I wanted to be able to, to help people with that. Northwestern did a great job on a, on a lot of levels, uh, but they uh, they fell short from, in my opinion, from the investment investment standpoint. And I, and I thought it was just them. Uh, but I just I realized once I once I really got into it that uh, I wasn't able to to do for my clients what I what I wanted. There were some gaps, some some issues, some logical fallacies that I kept kept seeing with the investment philosophy that they had, and so that ultimately, after six years there uh, or almost six years, that led me to 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 leave and go off on my own and and really start that journey of trying to answer those questions that I that I had. Um, and, and I realized very quickly after doing that, that it wasn't just Northwestern, that it was just, it was the industry where I had my problem because all the resources I, I looked to, all the, you know, the experts that I wanted to, to help guide me to, to find these, these solutions to the problems I was finding, they all said the same thing. They all had a similar, you know, stock and bond, buy and hold strategy, set it and forget it. And there were some issues, which obviously we'll, we'll get into, um, that ultimately led me to to doing what I do today and to, to writing that book. Yeah, awesome. So just to recap on that, yeah, you uh, in 2012, you qualified for the Million Dollar Roundtable, which is an exclusive uh, association representing the top 1% of the industry. You worked in the industry for uh, nearly six years, and December 31st, 2015, uh, you left your job and uh, lift off your savings, and you researched desperately to find a better way for yourself and anyone who wanted to invest in shares as well. Um, and yeah, a little bit in the book. It's a fantastic book. I've read it. Uh, for those listening, go out there, check out the book. Um, um, you were reading the Wall Street Journal and studying the pricing tables at the age of 12. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if I was, I wasn't, I didn't really know what I was doing, but uh, yeah, the numbers were interesting. I, it was fun to watch them change from issue to issue. And uh, yeah, I mean, that just started the passion. It lit the fire, I guess, but uh, I, I didn't really yeah, get, get a handle on it for, for uh, quite a bit after that. But. Got it. Uh, a mini Warren Buffett. Um, when did you start Spicer Capital? Was that in uh, 2016? Uh, yeah, some some iteration of it was was born there. I had a few clients that wanted to come with me. Uh, it kind of started more as a hedge fund style, just in that it was you know it was just me managing a, a small group of investors' money, um, and and they kind of understood the path that I was on. Um, you know, and, and they. They understood my issues. You know, I had had personal conversations with them about the issues that I talked about in this book, and they, they trusted me to find those answers. And so, that's where that's where Spice Capital was born. It's evolved since then, as I've been able to find uh, more mainstream solutions to these problems. Yeah, awesome. And we'll jump into the book. Uh, just before we do that, I believe you've got uh, a dedication on the book, which is Jessica Gray, Lyle, Cass, and Rosie. Who are those people? Oh, those, that's my, my family. Jessica's my wife. Um, and then, yeah, those are my, my four kids. Uh, Rosie's uh, nine months now and Gray's nine years old. So that's the, that's the span. 
Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's nice. Uh, you dedicated the book to your family. Uh, getting into it, so uh, yeah, the introduction of the book. You talk about that too, you're not a doomsdayist, uh, although it may sound uh, this way firsthand. You had no wish to sort of be an alarmist. Um, after years of searching for better solutions to you know to each of these problems, you reached a, a point where um, you felt that your investments could be better withstand the unpredictable yet inevitable inevitable market chaos and stress without compromising the growth of traditional portfolio talk to me a little about the introduction of the book which, which you have so what what is the book about in a nutshell uh yeah so i mean it's interesting that you mentioned the the dedication there uh, i i do owe a lot of i mean i talk about this in the acknowledgments at the end a, a lot of the way that i approach investing but also i mean things in life in general to to my wife she's much more just inherently a, a critical thinker than than i was uh and so i you know just i've learned that from her and uh that's what you know initially when i started in the career i i i just took things at face value um you know it's what the experts at Northwestern told me to do. That's what I did. I did that for a handful of years before it started to eat at me. And then I was able to apply some of those critical thinking ideas to what I was doing from an investment perspective. And, and that's where I found these, these flaws. But anyway, I, I think that's, uh, I, I owe a lot of that to, to her. Um, and, and that's, I mean, that's kind of what the, the introduction um, talks about is that, you know, I've identified these flaws with the, with the way of doing things. Um, and, uh, there, you know, if you're not, uh, they, in a way they, they kind of, uh, they, they, they cause problems for, for investors. And that, you know, if you understand these myths and you understand, and you start to doubt the stock and bundle only buy and hold strategy, it can make your life a little bit more stressful. Um, and so, you know, that's, it's, it's a catch 22. A lot of people don't want to, as with anything, they don't want to dig in and realize that they have that that maybe they should be more involved in this than they initially wanted to. Maybe they need to find somebody that they can trust more to to be able to help them overcome these these issues. Who understands these issues themselves? Um, and you know, it's it's kind of the ignorance is bliss idea, right? A, a lot of people would prefer to to remain that way versus doing doing the research. And so I actually, I mean, I put that disclaimer at the end of the introduction, which you know, I, th I think it. The disclaimer being that, you know, if, if you don't want that information, that stress, then you probably shouldn't read this. Um, and I get that that's going to be provocative to some people, but to some people, I hope it, you know, I, it'll turn them off. I, I really think, you know, I, I, the, I, the title and, and the introduction um, kind of paint the picture of, of what the book is going to be about, the doubts that, that the seeds of doubt that it's, it's going to plant in their heads about the traditional advice that they've received. And I really think it's the feedback I've gotten from people who've read it is I really think it speaks to people who already started to have these doubts before. Like myself, you know, before I wrote the book, if if this had been around, it would have sped up my journey in, in understanding these issues and then ultimately finding the solutions. And so that's why that's why I felt like I needed to put that out there. Yeah, thank you for uh, elaborating and expanding on that. It's it's a big subject and it is a big beast. The stock market, understanding that it's for a lot of people, it's a, it's a scary giant and very complicated. And you do break it down quite good. What we're going to do, we're going to go through some of the myths of the stock market. So number one, um, the stock market averages 12% uh, per year. Uh, tell us why that's a myth. Yeah, and this I, it depends on on where you're at as far as your your financial understanding. Uh, so some people hearing that would be like, well, yeah, of course that's not that's not the case. Um, and so I, you know, I hope that that that's where most people are at. Um, at the same time, there are some very prominent authorities in the world of finance uh, who that's that's the ideology that they promote that that, that you should expect a twelve percent return. I mean, I, I and that's that's just not true. Um, and so if, if people go into their planning with that expectation, uh, they're setting themselves up for a high probability of, of failure. And that's just not, that's not a good way to, to start off your, your planning. Um, Dave Ramsey is, is great for, for a lot of, a lot of things. He did a good job at making, getting out of debt entertaining and, and has helped a lot of people from that perspective. But when it comes to investments, he, he's, I think he falls short pretty significantly. And I mean, he suffers from, you know, that the same thing that a lot of people suffer from and a lot of issues and the inability to, to consider things another way. He has his mindset, you know, this is how it is. And this is, this is what he's going to 
preach and promote. And so when you you know do a Google search for what this what you can expect from the stock market, his his search results come up and he says that you can expect 12% per year. And he even, you know, he says that's what the, the S&P 500 has done over its history. And that is not, it's not true. Um, and, and very simple, it's this, this one's easy as far as, as myths go. And that's why I say, I hope most of, most listeners who have any exposure or any experience with the market know that this is not true, but it's, it's the difference between a simple average and a, what's called a geometric average, um, and, or an arithmetic simple average or a geometric average. And it's funny because the, the, the source he cites for calculating the historical returns of the S&P 500, uh, when you follow through that link, they have a big disclaimer at the top of their page that says, be careful to not use a simple average because it, it's meaningless when it comes to rates of return. You know, a simple average is, is of course, if you have 0% and 50%, the average return over those two periods, I mean, if simple average would be you add them together and then divide by two, you get 25%. But if you had, um, but if you had a if if you had that as a return on your portfolio, that's that's not actually what you're you didn't average twenty five percent per per year, um, and and the calculation is is a little bit different, a little bit more complex, and so anyway, that's that's what uh, that's that's where that that myth falls short. If you if you look at the geometric average over the history of the S and P five hundred, it's it's actually ten point three percent instead of twelve point one percent. It's just I mean it's just a fact. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for expanding on that. Yeah, we get we get taught these little uh, these little lines, these little myths, and these little sentences. But there's a lot more to the story as well. And I think uh, a lot of people just eat up the shorthand version of what they think things are. Uh, but when you look deeper into anything, uh, the reality is that it's 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 not that too. Um, I love in the book how you sort of wrote that. Consider the millions of dollars each year is raked. Uh, from investment firms and their ad- advisors' management fees, and that most of the corporations and uh, rich and influential people have their their money tied up in into the stock prices, and they're basically the all they want to do is make sure that you're mindlessly storing your accumulated wealth in the stock market for them to get rich. And it's a game of, it's a game of store your money here and we'll make money off the management fees. So uh, thank you for expanding on that. Uh, myth number two, uh, you write in the book, you should expect a 10% return from your stocks. Why is that not true? Yeah. So that, and that goes into exactly what you just, you just mentioned there. Uh, so, you know, the 10% is a number that you, you get to after the after you understand the difference between actual return and average return, um, right? So the actual return is the one that we really care about. We don't really care about what the simple average is because that is meaningless for our actual returns. Um, and, and the reason for that is because when you're dealing with investments, and I, I still talk about this in myth one, but it, negative returns are so much more impactful than positive returns. And, and a lot of people don't, don't understand that, but you know, a hundred percent gain um, only requires a, a 50% loss to, to wipe that away, right? If you have $100, it goes up by 100%. Now you have 200, a 50% loss is going to entirely wipe that away. You're back where you started. And again, if you do the simple average on that, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't accurately tell the, the full story. In reality, the geometric average there was 0%. You, you're back where you started. You have $100 again. Um, and that, that's what's more important. The, the negatives weigh so much more on, on your portfolio. Um, if you had a negative 50% return, you need a 100% positive return to make that back. So anyway, that's, that's, why, that's what contributes to why the geometric average is different from the, the actual average. But then once you get down to the 10%, the reason that I, that I say you shouldn't expect that from your returns on stocks is most people aren't doing that on their own. Uh, they're using an advisor. They're plugging it into funds, and so when you do that, you you have to take those fees out as well. And I'm not saying fees are bad. Um, I'm saying that people need to understand what their fees are. Like they they need to have that transparency on and and dig into what their fees are, and then make sure that they're getting enough value for those fees that they're paying. Um, you know, I, I charge fees when I manage clients money. There, there are advisors out there who do a great job who charge fees and, and that's that's fine. There are also a lot of advisors who just plug into that buy and hold stock and bond only portfolio approach. They don't really add that much value and they charge just as much fees. And so, you know, that's you, you need to be aware of what you're getting, the value you're getting, and then make sure that it's it's worth it to you. 
But when you add in the average fee that advisors charge, and then you add in the average fund fee, that knocks the, the number down to, to around 8%, a little north of 8% after you factor out those, those averages, not even the high end of, of what you could find there. And I, and I do run through that in the book where you know we, we explore some of the, the worst uh, firms and, and the charge of the highest fees to, to smaller investors. And, and, it, and the, the effect that that has on their portfolio is, is significant. Um, it's, it's very, very damaging. So yeah, there, there yeah. is there is a person who could be doing it on their own, no advisor. They find a really low cost ETF, and and yes, for them, their return could be really close to ten percent, historically based. Their historically based return, and as you know, you know that's once I get to myth ten, I you know I say maybe we shouldn't put so much uh, give so much credence to what's happened in the past. Um, but we're building there. Uh, but yeah, so if you did it all on your own, if that's what you wanted to do, then yeah, maybe you could get 10%. Most people aren't doing that. Most people need to factor out the additional variables as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for uh, for explaining that. What I got from it was just the reality that you're trying to teach people. Hey, it's, it's the reality of the number that you are uh, going to get uh, it's instead of the illusion of what you think you're going to get as well. So, you know, a small 1.5% or 2.5% fee might not sound a lot, but compound that over a 20, 30 year hold and buy strategy, you're making someone else rich guaranteed. So that's their guaranteed fee. It's not a guarantee return for yourself, but they're, they're guaranteed you're going to pay, pay for someone else's uh, third or fourth house. <laughs> um, jumping into myth number three, you talk about yeah, you can count on a return of a at least 8% from your stock investments. Why is that a myth? So I was just going logical progression here, right? We started at 12, we knocked it down to 10. That's where we ended the first chapter and they say, well, now you got to knock it down further. And now, you know, after those fees, if you've knocked those off and you're like, fine, I'll just be conservative and I'll say 8%. That is going to be true for some people. Again, historically based. It's going to be true for some people, but historically, when you, when you look at history, it's not going to be true for others. Um, and that's because timing matters. And, and so, you know, this was really illustrated to me whenever I, I was early in the industry. Uh, you know, so I, I started working with clients in 2010. And so the financial crisis had, had happened. Um, you know, there were, there were a lot of people struggling to, to meet their retirement goals all the way through 2013 is where I, I still, you know, was, was dealing with new people coming in and saying, I, I need help. I'm, I'm upset with what my old advisor did, whatever. I lost a lot of money. Everybody lost money during that time. And so, you know, it, it, you're a victim of, of, of timing there. Uh, and so what I'm suggesting here is that, and well, I guess I'm going to bleed into, into to myth four here, but the, a better solution is to, to prepare yourself for a, a range of possibilities. Because um, myth four, and I'll, I'll steal, steal, steal your thunder, says a single return assumption is sufficient when planning for retirement. And that's, you know, the people will plug in in their Excel spreadsheet or financial advisors will and say, OK, well, if we assume 8 percent or even if we're conservative, and we assume 6 percent over the next 10 years, 20 years, whatever, then this is what you're going to look like. That's fine for really base level planning. But as far as for helping you prepare for what the possibilities are, that, that's not it, it falls short. Um, and, and it can leave people with surprises. And that's why, you know, just person, client after client that was coming in the door uh, after the, the, the Great Recession, they weren't prepared for that. Their advisor had, had led them to expect a conservative 8%, a conservative 6%. It didn't matter. They ended up losing a significant amount over, you know, the decade uh, leading, leading up to and, and through the, the Great Recession. And, and so when you, when you study different periods of history, if you look over any 30 year period, sure, the market has averaged the worst case, a 7% annualized return, even after you account for all the fees and everything. So if you're 30 and you're planning for when you're 60, fine, you can use that assumption, again, historically based, and we'll, we'll break that down in a second. But if you shorten the yeah. timeline, which you will, as you get older, right? So you started at 30, now you're 40 and you plan on retiring at 60. Now you have a 20 year time horizon. When you shorten it there, the average annual return, uh, the worst case that's happened historically is more like one point something percent. Um, when you go down to, to a 10 year window, which again, somebody will get there. So, you know, as you're planning, like you're getting closer, your window is shortening. You can't just say, oh, well, I, I started 30 years out. So that's the only assumption I ever need. As you get closer and closer to that window, you need to realize that it is possible that these worst case scenarios can happen historically based. And so, 
for example, the five-year period, you know, your five years from retirement, the worst case historical five-year period for the S&P 500 was a negative 13.7%. Average annual return, not, not total loss. I mean, the total loss was more, but average annual return was negative 13.7%. So somebody who's 55 trying to retire at 60 and is on track to meet their goals, maybe they're, they've met their goals and they're expecting a conservative 6% growth in their portfolio or 8% or whatever, they're gonna be sorely disappointed when at the end of those five years, they've, they've lost an average of 13.7%. Again, that is worst case scenario, sure. But uh, it was one in six, if you, you roll the die, one in six of those five year periods historically has been negative, that average annual return over five years. So every year you're rolling to the die to see if your last five years gave you a, a, a negative return or a positive return. And most people, you know, when you yeah. think about it like that, like that you, you don't want to gamble with your retirement savings as you're getting closer and closer to retirement. And so realizing that can help you better prepare. Then once you get into retirement, even more so, I mean, that, that's a reality. If the first five years of your retirement, you realized a, a negative 10% average annualized return, it would be devastating. It would change your plans. You'd have to go back to work. You'd have to figure something else out. Most people would. Um, most people don't have enough flexible cash flow to, to, for that to happen. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the, the issue with, with those, with just assuming an 8% or, or just e e any static number is that it's, it's not, it's not as easy as that. Um, and at, at the end of that fourth myth, I mean, I, I know you I'm sure you saw that I put together just a chart that, that illustrates some possibilities. You know, it, I, I think people should be aware of, you know, what's the worst case historical scenario over a 30 year period, 20 year period, 10 year period, five year period. So when you're planning, you can prepare yourself for that worst case scenario, uh, maybe invest accordingly. Um, and then I also look at the percentage of times you uh, have a 2% or less return, but just because, you know, that happens over uh, when you're, when you're withdrawing money from your account, uh, there, I think like, what was it? 2% of the 2% of the time over a 30 year period, you you've realized less than 2% annualized return. I know that was a lot of percentages, but um, I hope that makes sense. Just that if you're expecting an 8% annualized return and over that 30 year period, if you were withdrawing money over that time, so throughout retirement, your effective annualized return could be 2% or less historically. That's what it has yeah. been. Now, uh, talk to me about inflation and, and why uh, we don't really factor in inflation. I know the U.S. inflation has gone up in the last two years, uh, up to sort of hovering around 7.5% as we speak. But uh, talk to me about inflation a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's that's absolutely a concern. And I, th I think uh, it doesn't come up that much now because it hasn't really been a problem. Um, but it is uh, definitely... Yeah, it's uh, it's ramping up, and that's something that I talk to my clients about. I mean, I've, I've made some YouTube videos about it. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's something that people should be aware of, um, and it and it is going to impact these these expect the expected real returns, right? I mean, because right, if you're if the inflation is at ten percent per year or seven percent per year, and the market, you know, now you need to now you need to figure out you know the real return of of your market investments. Presumably, the market should be going up by more than normal as well if everything else is also going up by more than normal but is it enough to offset those returns and yeah when you look at periods of high inflation in the past uh yeah that's that's significantly eaten into the actual returns that people the real returns that people have realized from the market yeah great and uh we'll jump into myth number five which is you can just ignore your emotions and not get caught up in excitement around bubbles you you talk about sort of the behavior gap um of investment return an investor return and that behavior gap touch on that um a little bit about uh the behavior gap and how you know many emotional factors fuel this behavior two of the largest is herd mentality and loss aversion so if you could talk a bit about that Absolutely. Yeah. And, and this is so the first four really, you know, kind of fit together. This just a logical progression of, you know, the 12 percent down to 8 percent and then not using a, a single number at all. And just, you know, realizing that there are a lot more variables at play that you should prepare for. This one is uh, so advisors. I mean, at Northwestern when I was when I was there and I, I'm not calling them out. This is this, that's industry. I mean, I was taught the, the way of the industry. That's not it's not just them. But 
Um, the way that most advisors are taught, the, when you look online, the mainstream advice is just to buy and hold, to put your head down, ignore what's going on, ignore the chaos. Um, and that's really hard to do. Um, it, it seems easy enough whenever you're, whenever an advisor is just, you know, telling you about it. And like, as long as you stay the course, it's always been fine. But I think when people get into the middle of chaos, they realize the reality of what I'm talking about in this book. And so part of what I want to do with this book is bring that, highlight that reality before there's the chaos, you know, the, the requisite chaos to help people realize that because that's kind of too late. Um, and they, they, they realize that, okay, in the past, it's always been fine, but that's not a guarantee of the future. And I, I know we'll get there, um, but it's, these all kind of work together here. So in, in myth five, as you pointed out, I, mean, I start by talking about the story of, of Peter Lynch, who's a, who's a financial, who was a, a mutual fund manager with a legendary track record where he averaged you know, more than 20% per year. But whenever they studied the individual investors in his fund, when, when he studied or when Fidelity studied it, they, they got different results. But the individual investors in his fund, um, Fidelity found that they actually lost money on, on an average annualized basis. Um, his number was just that they made quite a bit less than him. Regardless, it just shows that the individual investors didn't perform as well as the, the fund. And, and the reason is that the fund is just tracked from start to, to finish, right? I mean, there, there's no, it's not, it doesn't, there's no them, the fund moving in or out of the market, right? It's just, it's just, it is invested over that time period. Whereas the individual investors have the decision of whether or not to move in or out of the market. And you would see this if you studied the, the charts, the, the graph of his, of his performance over those 13 years, I think it was that he was investing that when he was doing well, when he had a really, really good year, the most amount of money moved in. And then when he had a bad year, which he had some uh, individual bad years, the largest amount of money was leaving. Like people were exiting his fund to move on to a different fund. Uh, and then he'd have a good year and it was the same thing. I mean, it, it's just, we see that psychology of the way that investors behave time and time again in individual funds, in the market as a whole, you know, it's, they just, they, they make on the whole, the wrong decisions at the wrong time. They get in at the wrong times, they get out at the wrong times. Uh, and that's just, I mean, from the data historically. So as much as we would like to tell ourselves, it's, it's not that this is new information. Oh, just stay the course. Oh, that's a novel idea. It's not. I mean, this has been, that idea has been around for, for decades, but still people are still making the wrong decisions. So that, that idea alone isn't, isn't helping. And yeah, through, throughout the chapter, I, mean, I break down very specific, you know, all these specific historical examples to try to help people put their, put themselves in the, in those shoes and see how difficult yeah. it would have been to, to stay out of the emotion. Yeah, some of the stories and tales you tell, I want you to expand on one, which is uh, Newton and the South Company. Can you explain this to our listeners? Yeah. What, what was this about? Yeah, this, yeah that's, a, that's a fun one. Uh, just because I, everyone knows Sir Isaac Newton and, uh, you know, he was obviously brilliant. Uh, he was one of the, the elites, uh, the, the, the higher class. Um, and so whenever the South Sea Company went public, when they started selling shares, they had this great story. They had a, they, there was a new paradigm. They had made a deal with the government that they were gonna get all of the contracts to uh, ship to, to the, the new world, right? And, and to bring back the riches of the new world, right? This was a, it was a good deal, right? I mean, and, and so he bought share, he got shares early. He got in early because he was, you know, he was well-to-do. Uh, and his shares immediately went up significantly. Um, he sold at like 200, it doesn't matter, let's just say 200, 200 pounds. Uh, and, and, and he was satisfied. He had, he had made a good return on his, you know, cheap shares that, that quickly went up. But then he saw his friends who got in later still making money and, and it just, the price kept going up. And, you know, I, it, it just, if you think about that, like him going to parties with all of his friends, you know, whatever, I think of Isaac Newton at parties, but, um, you know, and he's, he's obviously brilliant how much heat do you think you would get from his from his less intelligent friends who are making way more money than him now that you know oh he sold way too early he had i, I don't you could put that in today's context you know paper hands or, or whatever you know he didn't he he was he was weak whatever and so at, at 700 he he buys back in so there's a big gap there because it, it had kept going up the the shares of the south sea south sea company and then that was really close to the top but he bought back in with 
almost all of his money because he wanted to make up for that lost ground. He was he he gave in to the the peer pressure, to the emotion of it all. It, it just kept going up. He was expecting it to come down, and then he was the they say the the, the greatest fool, right? Which is you know I, I interesting because of how brilliant he was. Um, but yeah, then the the market crashed. Nobody wanted to buy the the shares, and and he lost all of his money. Yeah, great story and uh, well said. And thank you for explaining that. And another story you go on about what happened to Japan in the in the mid eighties to the late late eighties. For those who don't know, yeah, they just had a, they had a really rapid expansion. Uh, you know, ever since uh, the end of World War II, you know, we stepped in and and helped them. I mean, you don't have to. We don't have to get political there, but like, you know, as far as getting them on their way, and and they, I mean, they they took off their their economy. Um, and then in the ninth, in the late eighties, uh, they, that was just the height of their, of their growth. Uh, their stock market was taking off their real estate land. Their real estate was incredibly valuable, uh, really expensive, same type of mentality. I mean, they, they, the Imperial palace was worth more than the entire state of California. Like the, all the, if you bought up all the land in the state of California, it would have been cheaper than just this one, you know, it's one building, uh, one plot of land in, in Japan. And the reason they, you know, they would say we could justify this because there's limited amount of inhabitable land on, on the island. Like it, you know, it makes sense, right? It was, it was different. This time is different. It's always, it's always different. This is, there's a reason that we can explain why this thing is going up so crazy. In hindsight, it seems obvious, but in the moment you're like, you hear the experts give you that reason. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense why it's different. And you can apply that to, to today. And that's kind of the point, but uh, the, uh, Two very well-to-do, very intelligent experts wrote a book uh, called "The Japan That Can Say No." Right, right, right. In, it just, I think it was in December of of, of 1989, um, and and it was referring to it can say no to the U.S. So like you know, arguing that Japan is now, you know, past. We don't need we don't need their help anymore. We can you know we can be our our own superpower. Like we don't have to rely on the U.S. anymore. Um, it was one of the founders of Sony uh, and a guy that went on to become the uh, the mayor of Tokyo. I, yeah. Uh, anyway, so very, very influential, very intelligent, respected individuals who, who wrote this book. Um, but they were talking about how, you know, things were going to keep soaring. And that was right at the, the highest point of the zeitgeist in, in Japan. Um, and yeah, de December 1989, their market, the Nikkei 225, which is like the S&P 500 here, uh, peaked at just under 40,000 um, and it it crashed uh, going into the into 1990 and it's never it it's never recovered yet and it was uh, 2009 that their current bottom was in so 20 years later that they that they hit a low 80% lower than that high so 20 years the, to to be 80% down uh, today it's under thirty thousand, so you know they're making ground back. But I don't know how you feel about you know the the economic situation now in the world. Like, wouldn't be surprised if something happens again. You know they have a ton of debt. You know debt to GDP is is um, is one of the worst in the, in the world, if not the worst. Uh, so if if that starts to unravel. Who knows? They might set a, a new low and still not be able to break in, break out their former highs. But you know, we can come back to that. That is the you know the worst case example historically that that we can find. And and people don't like to look at that because they say, ah, the U.S. is different. It is. Everybody's different. Everything's different. Then there's no there's no perfect example of exactly what we're going through right now. By definition, there you cannot, you will not have that. There, there are too many variables here, but. What Japan proves is that the unexpected can happen. And if you had been following that advice in the late 1980s and just buying and holding and putting your money into the, the investments that the experts were saying, you know, the investments, the investments that experts today are telling us to put our money into, people would have been been ruined. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there, there were. I don't have specific exa examples. I can just look at what the market did. I'm sure there were people who, who were ruined from that advice. 
Yeah, I guess it's easy to, to look back in the history books and talk about black swan events, yeah. and, but it's very hard to understand when the next black swan event is happening. Who could have thought two years ago the black swan event that uh, the event that the world went through would have such an effect on not just everyone's life, but the stock market too. Yeah. Uh, jumping into myth number six, you talk about it's easy to not panic during these market crashes, and uh, you give um, some great examples about that, about how people's emotions are, are more impactful than the advice they get from the advisor and also talking about the tipping point as well can you expand on some of that uh yeah i mean i just uh i, I give the example just personal example of you know if you p- pick a fear that you have i mean I, I anytime i see a snake i tend i tend to jump i mean i don't it, it I, I point out that it's relatively irrational in the state that i'm in just in that there aren't that many poisonous snakes, you know, and statistically, but it doesn't matter if I see, you know, if I see the motion of a snake in the grass or, or whatever, you know, I, I tend to jump. And part of that problem is that there, I don't, if I saw snakes all the time and I, you know, I've got more comfortable, you know, even just a garden snake, if I saw it all the time and got more comfortable with it, I would be prepared for it. And I probably wouldn't jump. I wouldn't have that emotional reaction whenever I saw it. But the problem is I, I don't see them that often. They're not that common. And so, you know, when I see one once every two years, I still jump because, you know, I, I had told myself I wasn't going to do that. I had told myself that I was going to react emotionally, you know, rational and, and be calm. But in the moment, I, I can't. Um, and, you know, and it, it's it's because of that that limited frequency in, in, in interaction. And, and also because I, I don't have a certainty that, you know, that it's it's not going to be poisonous. And, and anyway, I mean, because there there are rare but there there are some that are the poisonous variety around here and i just i I relate that to the stock market and the stock market being even worse in that uh major crashes like the ones that that i talk about in the book um and then of course you know if anything worse than the things that we've had happen historically if anything worse than that happened obviously that's you know crashes like that don't happen very often um you know they might happen two or three times in somebody's lifetime, maybe only once or twice in your investing lifetime when you actually have money exposed to the market. So you're not prepared for it. You don't have a a level of frequency that's gonna help you prepare for that level of pain that you're gonna feel there, that that your emotions are gonna take you through, just like seeing that snake except except worse because the frequency is even less. And then as we'll get into it, I mean, you, you also don't have a certainty of outcome there. You don't know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, you know, despite the advisors and the experts telling you that history has proven that this, that it's this way, that, that it will recover, that everything will bounce back. But as we'll get into it, that's not, I don't think that's the case. That's a myth in and of itself. Yeah, emotions are definitely very strong and I like how you use the analogy about fear and snakes and yeah, when investing in the stock market, you know, people have their whole life savings and whole plans uh, based on this. So when shit hits the fan, uh, sometimes people react totally different than what they would normally do logically, you know, looking back in, in the past. So it's one of those things, emotion and the stock markets don't mix well, but they have to mix because we are human at the end of the day. Uh, jumping into myth seven, I always thought this was correct, but, you know, funds will out will help you outperform the market. Tell me why this is uh, just a myth. Yeah, so this is uh, this is one that I I get whenever again whenever I get like a Dave Ramsey supporter or somebody because he'll he'll point to his mutual funds which he'll you know he'll pull up his, his stack of papers and you know be like looking at his returns and say oh you see I've I've got another thirteen percent return and then put it away you know like does we don't know exactly what they are but he'll just say you know find the funds that have performed the best over the last 10 years and invest in those. Those are, those are the ones that, you know, obviously if they've performed the best in the last 10 years, they're going to perform the best in the, in the coming years. Sounds logical, makes sense. I pull some quotes that, you know, from, from him saying that on, on his side and some of, you know, his, his uh, other experts that are on his team that say that the, the S and P uh, company, S P global, uh, you know, who has the S P 500, that, that benchmark, they study this, they study the perform the performance of individual funds. Uh, they have very detailed analysis of how these funds have report, performed over the years. And it's, I mean, it's really interesting to, to look at the findings. I mean, they, I point to one where, um, I think it was the September, 2015 report. And, and I, or it was, it was the 2019 report, but it was looking at how the fund, the top quartile of funds 
So the, the best uh, quarter of funds, top 25% performers in 2015, there were 220 of those. How many of those were still in the top quartile the, the following year? Um, and chance, so you, you would you think chance, you can't flip a coin, but you know, whatever, you have four, 25% chance that that 25% of them are gonna, or sorry, 25% of them are gonna still be in that top quartile, right? That's that's what chance would give us, which would be 55, but there are actually only 31. So it's just 14% or 13%, somewhere around there of that initial of that initial pool, meaning that the less than, less, worse odds than chance would have given us were, were left in the top quartile. So those those best performers from this year were not in there the, the, the next year. And if you look out over a five year period, so from 2015 to 2000, to the end of 2019, or 14 through 19, uh, it, it was, if you follow that same, same pattern, you should have, uh, chance would give you one left in, in, that, in, that, in that top quartile. Um, if you always took 25% and left it, you know, there and, and there aren't any. So it's, you know, again, it's, it's worse, it's worse than chance. And you study those reports and it, and it shows that that that's a pretty regular theme that pops up that just because a fund has performed well in, in the past, often the data would suggest otherwise that, that it's, that is an indicator that it's going to perform worse in the future, oddly enough. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. And uh, the next sort of miss you uh, touch on, we've already touched on, but you talk about an advice will help you over, an advice will help you overcome your emotional biases, which we've already spoke about. You just need to buy and hold stocks and bonds. Uh, but what I want to jump into is myth number 11, which is uh, you should just do what the experts say. Uh, one of the famous quotes you write in the book about Mark Twain is, it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Um, I want you to talk to me about a little story in there about those who are the loudest. You talk about Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey. Uh, talk a little bit about that story and why that relates to, um, you know, just you shouldn't just listen to what the experts say. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I that's a, that's actually an analogy that I first heard um, Nassim Taleb who I, I, I talk about a lot in this book. That I wrote my first iteration of, of Stop Investing Like They Tell You just as notes um, in 2017. And then after that time, I read Fooled by Randomness by, by Nassim Taleb. And uh, I, was, it, I was like, this is, you know, this is, this is what I'm talking about. The, you know, he was fine. He was, I finally found somebody who was speaking to the issues that, that, I, that I was finding. Um, he does it in a much, much better, much more philosophical, uh, academic way, um, which I think makes it a little bit out of touch for the average investor. So that's part of the reason why I still felt like I needed to, to write this book. But he uses this, this example of, uh, from Homer's Odyssey where, uh, where Odysseus is, is about to pass the, the sirens and he wants to hear, he's heard how beautiful their song is, but he also has heard that listening to their song leads to, to, sudden, to sudden death. And, and so, or imminent, imminent demise, whatever. So he tells his, he's like, we're going to pass through here because I want to hear this song. But uh, he has his, uh, everyone else on the ship plug their ears with beeswax uh, so they couldn't hear the song. Uh, so they wouldn't be influenced and, you know, steer them into, into the rocks. Um, and then he has him, uh, has a, his crew tie him to the mast of, of the ship so that he wouldn't be tempted to, to make, to make the, the wrong decision after hearing it. So he had covered all his bases. He was going to get to hear it, but not be able to act on the, the issues that he was going to, that he was going to be faced with. And whenever he's, whenever they went through there and he heard the sirens, he started beg, he, he was like, change my mind. You know, he, he was begging his crew to, to let him, to let him go. Um, he's screaming at them cause he, you know, they were, he was compelled by the sirens call. Uh, and, uh, of course, you know, he had told them not to listen to him at that point. So luckily they didn't, they didn't let him go. Um, the, the message being that we are going, it, it, we don't really have an equivalent of, of beeswax that we could put in our ears to avoid the the sirens calls ar around us when the market starts crashing um especially if we have money exposed to it we're we're going to we're going to be seeing the statements we're gonna we're gonna feel some pain um and so what we need is uh, a mast that, that to tie ourselves to we need some some form of rational 
strategy that we've developed ahead of time uh, to to deal with those issues that we're inevitably going to to come across. Yeah, thank you for uh, expanding on the story, and that was a great one. And uh, you go into it about you know most investors w won't perceive the song for what it is and, until it's too late, and if history is an indication, the temptation becomes too strong for even the most intelligent and legendary among us. We all get caught up in the you know crypto at the moment. You know, everyone's talking about crypto. Invest here, you should invest there. It's too late. Oh, it's a low point now. And, you know, even for the most smart and intelligent, we sort of can't escape the conversation. Yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit about talking heads. Um, sure. And you talk, of, yeah. Well, and, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, you talk about the, the reason I say, you know, the most intelligent and I think there's probably footnotes there, right? And I mean, that's referencing Isaac Newton, who we could say, you know, of his time was the most intelligent person of his time. He still succ succumbed to those temptations. Uh, Stanley Druckenmiller, Druckenmiller is, a, is a famous investor. Uh, I talk about him in Myth 5 where... Uh, he, he, during the dot com bubble, he was, he saw it for what it was, but right at the height, he changed his mind. He was like, you know what? I must be missing something. I must be wrong. And he'll tell this story. Like I must be wrong. And so he, he shifted a whole bunch of his portfolio into technology stocks. And then almost immediately they started to crash. And you know, he's, he's an active trader and very astute and watching all of these things actively. He was able to get himself back out. He minimized his losses and, and he knew what to do from that. Uh, he still said it was a big mistake, but again, even the most expert among us can, can fall victim to, to that, that call. And, and, um, part of, uh, I was trying to part of that myth and, and let me know if I didn't answer your question. Cause I, um, but part of that myth uh, is talking about the the logical fallacy of just appealing to authority, which we're, we're really bad at when we're not just as humans, when we're not expert in something we want, we want an authority really badly. We want somebody that we can trust that we can look up to and just and do do what they say. And especially when the chorus, when when every when all of these talking heads, all of the experts are, are saying the same thing it's, we just want to believe that we don't want to think for ourselves. We don't want to think critically. And, you know, I give the example at the beginning of that chapter, um, you know, where it was about the, the scientist, the zoologist who had, who had said that there were 24 chromosomes and he, he was, you know, very well respected. Uh, and so nobody argued with that for decades, uh, even though there were, there was a long time before they finally said, okay, this guy was just wrong. There was obvious evidence, but people would, other experts would destroy their evidence that that this guy had been wrong because they didn't want to be shamed because everybody had this consensus. All these other experts had this consensus that it was it was 24 when it's actually you know 23. And like anyway, that's that's just an example of you know, we can get in this sound chamber where our echo chamber where you know everybody's saying the same thing and so nobody wants to speak out against that. And most you know the average person who doesn't have an expertise in in finance it's really hard to figure out the what to where to go what direction to go and that's you know that's the example of the sirens is it's just easier to to listen to the talking heads on tv to people on cnbc who are just you know just constant proponents for you know continue to continue to buy and and yeah i mean it's 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 confusing um it can it can make it it can make it difficult i mean I, i'm an, an advocate for for critically thinking about about these issues and I mean, I, I think people should, especially when they have a decent amount of money in the market, they should, unless they want, you know, a uh, nasty surprise at some point, they, they should take the time to figure this stuff out and, and find strategies and solutions that, that are going to prepare them for those inevitable, you know, the inevitable chaos that's going to come up. Yeah, totally right. Now, we're going to skip a couple of the myths um, because people should go out there and buy the book. It's a fantastic book, but it's not all about the stock market. And myth number 15 talks about the stock market is the only meaningful way for you to invest, which which it's not. So I'm going to jump into some examples, and I want you to sort of expand on that as well. But a great little quote you put in the book uh, about Henry Ford is, don't find fault, find a remedy. Anybody can complain. Um Number one, uh, where you can invest, you talk about start with yourself. Let's go with that and some of the things that you can do and invest in is number one is your career. Can you expand on that a little bit? Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the, the best places you can get return. Uh, I mean, it's just if, if you can find ways to maximize your earning potential. I mean, that's a, and that, it's not really my area of expertise, but when I have younger clients who are asking about what investment, you know, they have $10,000 here, where should they invest it? 
that's one of the first places introspectively that they should look is, is can I invest it in something in myself that can increase my earning potential going forward? Because that's going to pay dividends for the rest of their life. Yeah, and number two, you talk about your finance, financial education. I, um, I had a private mastermind dinner last night, and one of the ladies that was there told a story about her 19-year-old son who has just purchased his third property by the age of 19. Now, you might think, how can you service that, or where does he get that um, idea to do that? Well, when you have the two very astute financial uh, parents and understand the ways around that, your, educa- your financial education is is number one. So getting the wrong financial education, obviously some people are dealt the wrong hand with parents, uh, you know, and and weren't taught that. And the time they find out about financial education, they might be in their mid thirties and maybe it's a little bit too late and people are ahead of them. So talk to me a little bit about investing in your own financial education and why that's so important. Sure. And it's, it's, never too late i mean not to be cliche but i mean to to your point i mean yeah you might be behind somebody but uh i mean even if you're going into retirement uh i mean you know 60 65 70 whatever that might be it's this stuff is is very important it's critical to to understand and just so that you're prepared for the realities that that might happen and so yeah i mean a kind of you know self in a self-serving way i i think that that yeah, after after your career, that's one of the the best things that you can that you can invest in is making sure that that you understand that you have a strategy that you're confident in, that you've critically thought about the advice that you're hearing, uh, that you know, so that you really, whenever the storms come, that you're really prepared. You have that mast that we talked about that you can that you can hold on to, and you're not going to have that unless you spend the time to invest in in your financial education. Yeah. And the other one you talk about is your skills. Why is it so important? Um, another thing you can invest in, not just your career, your financial education, but your own skills. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's along the, the same lines. I mean, as, as I was saying, I mean, you're, you're increasing your ability, your opportunities to make money, you're increasing your marketability. Um, and, I, and I think that's, a, you know, I think that's a, a wise investment. And you talk about, you know, you talk about rental properties and that's, that's in that list there as well of, of other places that you can invest. And, I, you know, I, I put... I put a disclaimer at the beginning of the chapter in that, like, I, I almost didn't want to include this, the, the chapter, because I didn't want it to take away from the, the rest of the, the rest of the book. Um, you know, I, I don't dive deep into uh, a, a lot of these strategies. I don't want people to be disappointed if they, if they get there. Um, and part of that is, is regulation. I'm, I'm a registered investment advisor. And so I have the SEC, you know, breathing down my back, making sure that I don't, I don't say anything or give, give advice on a broad scale that I, that I shouldn't. So I have to be careful with that. And, you know, anyway, so that's why I'm not allowed to go into too much specifics. And then, you know, I, t- I talk about real estate and I've, you know, had some, I, I could have gone into more detail there. I think there are plenty of real estate books out there. There are plenty of experts that have, you know, that have, explained different strategies that you can use strategies that that i use i mean i learned them from from other books so i didn't need to to rehash that but i did want to bring that up as an alternative as a as a way that that you can diversify your portfolio in, in a meaningful way um to prepare for for some of this chaos and so yeah i mean yeah, that's just one of the the examples there yeah, you talk about stable uh, lifetime income strategies and some of the ones in there you put, yeah, you talked about sort of dividend stocks and real estate as well. But yeah, apart from sort of your career working on your financial education and your skills, you talk about monetize your passion and expertise. Talk a, a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it, that probably doesn't apply as much, well, uh, just to, you know, the older generation, the the, the people who are getting ready to retire um, but for younger individuals, I mean, yeah, you see it more and more where they're finding time in their in their free time to do something that you know is in line with their passion, where they can share their passion with the rest of the world and their expertise with the rest with the rest of the world. Um, and you know, it's, whether that's creating YouTube videos or creating a podcast or, or writing a book or whatever it might be, uh, ideally, it's probably best if you you know don't go all in it depends on your situation of course but i'm not suggesting that you go all in and you you know quit your job and you know you try to try to make it on on youtube or, or whatever but doing that on the side something that you're passionate about something that you're not expecting to to take off right away so you're mentally prepared for that over the long run if it is something you have expertise in and are passionate about that can that can pay off um, it can pay dividends over over the long run as you know as you've invested time into that 
Yeah, and one of the last things, uh, which is an alternative to the investment, like it's all about diverse diversifying your portfolio but the number one way to increase your wealth and change your life is sometimes building the business yeah yeah and that's i mean i I, yeah that's that's in there as well i mean it's it comes with its own set of risks there are there are a lot of risks there same with same with real estate it's it's not for everyone but for those for whom it is for uh they they uh yeah they can they can find like they they can utilize that to to be in an even better position than than uh, they otherwise would yeah, got it. And um, yeah, I know, I'm, I know you're short for time, so we will wrap this up uh, really quickly. But uh, what do people do next? So, you know, myth number 16, they talk about the stock market's too risky and should be avoided. But um, talk a little bit about if people want to find more about yourself and how they can get uh, your advice with uh, Spicer Capital. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I you can go to my website, spicercapital.com. That's probably one of the, the best places to, to just learn more about what I, what I do for my clients. Um, I also, I mean, I create videos on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel there. Just, uh, I believe it's under my name now, Steven Spicer CFP. Um, but yeah, those would probably be the best resources. That's where I'm, I'm most active. There's a, a way to schedule an appointment with me on my, on my site, but really, I mean, yeah, I would love for people to, to read their book, read the book and, and I'm interested in, in thoughts and, and I, I enjoy the conversations. I enjoy, I mean, I, I spent a decade of my life, you know, studying this and trying to try and understand it. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm passionate about it. And probably my, my, my favorite myth of all of them is myth number 10. Um, and so, you know, we, that we can leave that as a, as a teaser, I guess, for, for people, cause we, we jumped over it, but, uh, you know, that is, that is the kind of the crux of, of everything here. And that, uh, I mean, the title is you can use past data to prove what the market will do in the future. I mean, and if you wanted to make it even more extreme, what the market will do forever into the future. And, you know, most people seeing that myth would think, well, yeah, obviously that's not, that's not true. You can't use past data to forever predict the future. Yet that's exactly what we're doing with the, with the stock market. We're trying to use the past 100 and 150 years worth of data to suggest what might happen forever into the future. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think understanding that is, is key. Uh, and then from there, you can build uh, an understanding for strategies that, that will better protect you from the reality that is investing in the market. Yeah, and I, I think the biggest takeaway for me was uh, not only investing in your financial education, you know, like myself, I've, I've read many finance books and done this and the other, but uh, getting, partnering with financial experts like yourself, that that is the probably biggest step that's going to take your wealth to the next level and actually pull the trigger and take action on your, on your not just your financial education, but get some skin in the game as well and put some money in the game too. Uh, so to everyone out there, uh, thank you, Stephen, for being on the podcast. Uh, go to spicercapital.com to find out more. And uh, just before you go, talk a little bit about your YouTube channel. You've got some great, uh, great stuff there and information. Where can people find you on YouTube as well? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you can find it through the, through the website, uh, um, it, if you search Steven Spicer CFP, I mean that 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 should pull me up. But yeah, that's, uh, that's the name of my channel, and that's probably the best best way to to connect with me personally. You know, I mean, if people comment, and um, I'm, I always get back to them. So yeah, yeah perfect. I enjoy it. Great. Great. So, so thank you for writing the book, Stop Investing Like They Tell You To. To anyone out there who got a lot of value from uh, from Stephen, go out, follow him on YouTube, check out his website, buy his book. And uh, yeah, if you're in America, is it just uh, America, the clients you deal with, or is it uh, internationally as well? Uh, it's uh, just just America right now for uh, for like investment clients. I have some consulting clients that, that are all around, but uh, as far as like managing their money, that's that's yeah, just just here in the states, and that's just perfect. Regulation and if issues. you want state, state. <laughs> yeah, I understand. So if you want Stephen to manage your money and to grow your wealth and to get some real advice, check him out and park your money with Stephen. <laughs> Stephen, thank you for being on the best of Book Bits podcast, and Thanks, uh, you enjoy the rest of your day. And and thank you for all that you've done. You too. Thanks, Mike. All right, I'll speak to you soon. Take care.